<laughs> um, should we get started? Um, I will, Taylor, I'm just going to switch you to the host for a second. So okay. uh, if people are trickling in, you could let them in while I read my little speech for you all. Sure, sure. Okay, so hello and welcome to the first artist lecture of 2022 hosted by the Graduate Artist Forum at Georgia State University. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kate Kosak and I am the president of the Graduate Artist Forum, which is a club that consists of the graduate art students within the Ernest G. Welsh School of Art and Design. Today we are very excited to have Taylor Baldwin joining us virtually. Um, I met Taylor a few years ago at Wayfarer's Gallery in Brooklyn and have been a fan of his work ever since, so I'm really glad he agreed to share uh, his work with us today and as well as spend some time with a few of our MFA students tomorrow during individual studio visits. So Taylor Baldwin is an artist working primarily in sculpture, video, and installation. He received a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2005 and an MFA from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2007. He has been a resident at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, the Fine Arts Work Center, the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, and the Seven Below Arts Initiative. Baldwin has presented solo ex exhibitions at Wayfair's Gallery in Brooklyn, New York, Connor Contemporary Gallery in Washington, D.C., Land of Tomorrow Gallery in Louisville, Kentucky, Vox uh, Populi in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and has participated in group exhibitions at the Queens Museum of Art in Queens, New York, Tucson Museum of Contemporary Art in Tucson, Arizona, the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art in Norfolk, Virginia, the, Kent the Kentucky Museum of Arts and Crafts in Louisville, Kentucky, and the Zerker Gallery in Manhattan, New York. He is currently based out of Queens, New York, and teaches sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design. Baldwin's work collects and employs a very specific materiality, one with deeply researched site-specific history, which cohere to become objects that embody a productive friction between their physical, psychological, and historical contexts. Through these practices, he pursues objects, image, and ideas that sit on the edge of making and unmaking, barely clinging to coherence. So if you have any questions for Taylor throughout the presentation, uh, please type it into the chat and we'll go through them in order during our Q&A session. Um, and then we can unmute, unmute you at the time if you wanna ask Taylor personally. Um, but everyone should already be muted. Um, just please stay muted the entire time. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to you, Taylor, and you can just make me back to host and I will let stragglers in. Amazing. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Kate, um, and, and everybody at GSU for inviting me. I really, uh, one, of the, one of the most I've realized in the last several years as I've sort of like been navigating, you know, an art career, uh, that in, in particular, you know, a, a sculptural and installation based career that's not particularly commercially viable, that one of the most uh, valuable aspects of being an artist for me is actually the opportunity to be able to uh, talk about my work and meet in these kind of contexts and lecture contexts. So, um, and in particular in academic environments, like alongside my uh, sculpture career for whatever the last 15, 20 years. Um, uh, I've also been engaged in teaching as a sort of parallel practice that is just, is not necessarily a day job, but it's sort of just as important as a way to stay invested in, in ideas and communication um, linguistically. And so these lectures are really, really valuable to me. So I really appreciate your time and energy and attention. Uh, and thank you for being here and inviting me. Um, so I guess I'm going to share my screen. Boop. And then I'm going to bring up, uh, so you guys should be seeing my PowerPoint, correct? And I think this subtitle thing going around. Awesome. Yes. Okay, yes. so one thing to mention at the top, just to be <clears throat> full transparency, uh, in the last like five years, uh, I have, uh, I don't think that I have ever actually successfully completed the lecture that I set out to give because I've constantly gone on digressions and sort of gone down wormholes and talked more than I should have, which is just to say that concision is not my strong suit. 
um, but I've got a timer going and I've edited, actually, this is sort of my first version of a sort of second draft of my artist talk, um, where I've actually cut out an entire body of work that precedes this. Um, that is, you know, several sculptures and installations deep. Um, but, you know, suffice to say, I'm gonna, today I'm gonna go through, I might run out of time, um, but hopefully it'll be uh, useful and interesting. And I might need to cut things as I go, but I'll sort of gauge where people are at as I go. Um, but uh, primarily what I wanna do today also is something new where um, I'm gonna be showing you guys a, a single body of work um, and then a current body of ongoing work. So this, this body of work that we're about to look at is, um, is complete and it sort of culminated in an exhibition in 2017. And then ever since then, I've been working on another body of work. Um, and that sort of has, uh, that is is currently, I'm actually literally about to have the first exhibition sort of in this body of work on Saturday. So I'm in the, or a week from Saturday. So I'm in the midst of uh, sort of this big show prep. Um, and so I haven't actually done this before where I've shown work that's sort of in progress, but over the last, 15 years I've been working in a way where I will build up a series of sculptures and objects over the course of three to four years and then tour them in a series of exhibitions around the country, maybe more like a, a musician than a traditional artist where you build up a body of work and then tour it rather than uh, make a body of work for exhibition once and then you know either sale or, or storage. Um, and so, uh, that model has meant that like I will show and reshow sculptures over the course of three years, slowly building to sort of the final iteration of all of that work. Um, and so what I, I'm gonna do is start with this, uh, you know, sort of second to most recent body of work and then go on from there. Um, and then also as I'm going, um, I'm, I, you know, I know that uh, people are, are muted, but um, I'm not sure if there's a chat or, um, whatever, but I'm also happy to answer uh, questions at any point. So I might pause to just, you know, get a little feedback to, to sort of fight the, the sort of silent void that Zoom can be sometimes uh, as, as Christine was talking about earlier. Um, cool. So if that sounds good, oh, the one other thing is that I'm gonna jump between um, PowerPoint and then I have some videos to pull up that are in a finder window. So unfortunately I have to like minimize and bring it up and then bring it back, but I'll go through that. Um, as needed. But first up, uh, I'm starting with this exhibition in 2017 at the University of Arkansas in their Fine Arts Gallery uh, titled True Neutral Human. And it was the culmination, like I said, of a series of uh, a body of work that ran from 2014, 2015 to 2017. Um, and there were the primary bod the primary sort of mode of all of this work, it was composed of three to five works of sculpture that I made over the course of this two year period of time. And all of the works, um, involved in some way mining uh, sort of traditions or strategies of divination and traditions and strategies of trying to sort of sort of ways of predicting the future. And so uh, before I jump too far into that, um, I will, I'll show actually one thing to also mention at the top before I get started is that um, since graduating from uh, graduate school in 2007 from VCU, ever since uh, my thesis work, moving forward, um, I worked in a way where I was sort of slowly cultivating a studio practice where I only worked with materials that were uh, salvaged or borrow, or, you know, bartered for, um, reclaimed, reused, uh, you know, stolen, or in some way acquired um, by avoiding the new market. And so um, the reasons for why I was doing that sort of evolve and shift over uh, you know, all of the sort of 15 to 20 years since graduating uh, grad school, but um, that core practice has been the same throughout and has been like really so that's something that has been the anchor point for all of the work that I've made since. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about sort of reclaimed and salvage and reuse and material histories, which is really like, I think my driving interest in sculpture and objects and form and material, because you can see materials record, physical matter records its history in its surface and in its form. And so it's a way of sort of like working with the sort of immaterial structures that shape history by shaping and thinking about the material that passes through it. So a lot of uh, uh, the work that I'm gonna show you also have really detailed exhaustive material lists. This was a practice that I started um, in the body of work before this, where I, I um, uh, lived basically semi-nomadically for a period of 
four years where I bounced between residencies um, and various like, you know, friends' houses at, at different sort of punk scenes across the U.S. Um, right after grad school. And, and over that period of time, I really cultivated this sort of salvaging, scrapping, reuse, reclaiming, and sort of doing deep research into the regional specificity of uh, material landscapes, material almost as an ecosystem that's hyper-specific to location. Um, anyway, and that's actually where uh, I, I uh, met uh, Christina in 2011 um, at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art. Um, okay, cool. So um, this is an image from that exhibition, and I'm going to walk through three of the sort of major, four of the major works in this exhibition. Um, and first, I'll show just a little, let's see, just to get this video mode running. Um, this was a, a really quick slideshow that I made for this exhibition. All right, so just to start out, the first the first work that I'm going to show you in this is actually a work that preceded. It's the first thing in this body of work that uh, you know it was. It's a video work actually that finished in 2014, titled "The Body," um, and I believe I have this video actually in the. Um, there we go. Yeah. I have this video in the PowerPoint. Um, and so I'll play this video and then I'll talk a little bit about it, but just a, a bit of a trigger warning um, to everybody. This is essentially a simulated autopsy and everything that entails. So if you, uh, nothing is, it's all inanimate material, but just to give you guys a heads up, um, there's some like objectively some pretty squicky stuff in here. So um, this is a, a, a 45 minute long single take over two cameras um, that was shot in 2013 and then edited together and finalized as a video installation in 2014. This, what you're about to see is a four minute excerpt. I'll bounce around a bit, but um, normally the video plays as a single continuous shot on a monitor. Um, and this is just sort of cut throughout the length of that timeline. This is probably the most challenging part. <laughs>
Um, oh, sorry, I jumped ahead sooner than I meant to, but that's fine. That was essentially the end. Um, and so one of the things that, the reason why I like starting with this for this body of work in particular, I mean, besides it being the very first work is that um, it, it, because of the sort of, it was the first time that I had ever made an object for anything other than the human eye. Uh, it was being made for a camera. Um, I, I kind of tricked myself into this way of unlearning and un, undoing a lot of the sort of very traditional sculpture training that I had had. I, was, I went to some pretty traditional programs. I had no background in object making and no framework for object making before going to school, like most people, um, or at least in my experience, like most people. And so I learned from two, you know, relatively traditional making oriented institutions. And ever since, the, like leaving those programs, I really had to, to constantly fight my knowledge of the technique and the craft um, and, and fight it directing me towards, you know, how, how the object should be as opposed to sort of other criteria. And I made this work at a residency with 65 other people in the woods. This was made uh, at the Skowhegan School for Painting and Sculpture in, in rural Maine. And it's 65 people from wildly divergent backgrounds. Um, and so for the, you know, not necessarily the first time, but I, I really was in a place where my particular framework for making things wasn't being reinforced by everybody else around me or by the institution. And, and it was really being challenged. And there was a, uh, an abnormal number of cinematographers and filmmakers at that residency that year. And so I was surrounded by all these people who were thinking about things in terms of image and moving image, um, which was really different than my experience uh, prior to that, uh, in, in particular at VCU, which is a, uh, a really sculpture making oriented school in a town that has uh, sort of a disproportionate number of sculptors per capita just because of the program there. Um, and so, all of a sudden in this, I was in this position where a lot of the normal frameworks I would use for making an object were suspended because it only had to last uh, as long as it needed to to be recorded by the camera and it only needed to um, look a certain way from a certain angle because the perspective was locked and the materials didn't have to be stand up to the sort of criteria of lasting beyond the moment and and also it was a moment where I was working at a really frenetic pace because I was working on a film production schedule rather than an object production schedule, which is not, you know, I, I, I work slowly, I work methodically sort of naturally. And, and, um, and so those challenges were really useful because I had basically, I had recruited a lot of these filmmakers to sort of volunteer. We were doing a Skillshare where I was, I was helping out with their projects, they were helping out with mine. And so I had to work to their schedule and I had to work to the sort of pacing of a prop object rather than a sculptural object. So what that meant is that this object came together really, really quickly and it came together in a way where um, I was able to do things like use paint and motor oil and vegetable shortening. And because we were in the woods in the middle of nowhere, it was really just sort of like scramble to find whatever material I could from whatever. Uh, sources I could and so I was like getting vegetable shortening from the, like the, the the kitchen and talking to the cooks be like what kind of materials do you have that I could use that are let me do whatever like the the heart is uh you know just latex gloves filled with paint wrapped in like a sort of onion bag mesh and, like afghans and carpet foam and this is stretch wrap and uh, raw clay and uh, motor oil is in there, sand, you know, the eyes are just balloons filled with oops paint from the um, hardware store. Uh, it was all material that I could get, you know, as cheaply or for free as possible. And it really wound up being this weird sort of community effort. But one of the most um, useful things about it was, uh, and that ultimately came into play in the rest of the work that I'm show you, gonna show you. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm showing you this now is because it also um, forced me into a position to work where I wasn't working considering, I wasn't doing what I was used to doing, which was considering the experience of looking at the object as the primary like thing that shapes what the object is. It was actually like, oh, I have to imagine making an object for video. I am actually like suspending myself into this different experience that isn't my own in order to make an object that's shaped by that. And I actually wasn't thinking about what the object looked like. It was more how it operated, what it did, building it from the inside out thoroughly around a stolen um, plastic skeleton that I took from the drawing. They have like a drawing still life room. Um, you know, and so it was entirely based around this other perspective that wasn't my own. And 
I wasn't thinking primarily about the sort of aesthetic connotations of the object itself. I was thinking about the logic of making from the inside out in, in, in inhabiting this other belief system. And that wound up being really, really useful later on. Uh, that uh, which you know it's kind of nascent here but then winds up becoming really like central later on um, but just to show you you know this the the sort of all of these other perspectives and vantage points on this object that were totally locked out because it was a video it's a really simple thing and i might be belaboring this but it at least because i had a pretty pretty like traditional background that really like blew my fragile little mind but one of the things that became really fascinating too was that um, as this project was happening, everybody at the residency kept asking like, so when's the performance? And I was like, it's not a performance I'm making a video. It's gonna, they're like, but when is the performance gonna happen? And I was like, there's no performance. I'm just making the object and I'm gonna open the object up and film it. And they're like, okay, when are you doing the thing? And I refused to tell people because I was wildly uncomfortable with performance. Um, but eventually like it was these, it's this barn, uh, studio and by the time we wound up filming it which I did with the help of a, you know a bunch of other filmmakers and we built these elaborate rigs that sort of suspended the cameras and suspended the sort of boom mics to record really sort of microtonal like close-up high fidelity sound uh, everybody wound up you know standing around outside and watching it and it wound up becoming a performance whether I planned it or not but it was uh, uh, you know it sort of wound up mimicking uh, surgery theater but it was really this sort of like shift in framework and perspective that uh, wound up becoming sort of the most important element later on. The idea that um, I had to inhabit a, a different belief system in order to shape the object. Um, and so moving on, these next three weeks, uh, next three works are the, the, the works that are sort of central to this body of work and that are primarily uh, shaped around thinking about modes of divination and modes of predicting the future. Um, and so for each of these three works, sort of what I learned from that video work, I carried forward, you know, that was sort of a byproduct and an accident. I, I used as the central organizing principle to these works. Um, and so this work's titled The Plague Year. It's a sculpture. It's actually a, a, a self-portrait in the style of a medieval, um, reliquary that I'll, I'll show you in a bit, but um, through this, there, over the course of this body of work, I cultivated a pretty rigorous um, lifestyle and belief system where I lived as a medieval aesthetic mystic. Um, and I did a before entering, when what that means is I essentially lived according to a number of like rules and strictures that were set down at different moments of uh, crisis, different moments of civilizational crisis where people were sort of essentially weighing uh, existential levels of, uh, you know, risk of annihilation or self-annihilation. And there's this weird tendency across, uh, you know, sort of what we refer to as dark ages, um, but different moments where civilization shrank and contracted. There was one at the turn of the, uh, you know, at the 400s BC, there was one in the Byzantine era, and there was one in, in uh, medieval era that's probably the most, most well known. Um, and at most, at all of these moments of, of uh, quote unquote dark ages where sort of society and civilization recedes and collapses, um, there are very strong spiritual movements around um, aesthetism, monast monasticism, and, and mysticism that are based around essentially isolation. Um, and so uh, I, one of the things that prompted this, and it's kind of weird to talk about now, but I think it's kind of essential for these works, but one of the things that prompted this, this period, this work um, was sort of initiated by and spanned uh, one of the moments of just situationally sort of the deepest depression that I had ever experienced for me personally, and was sort of rooted in that. And one of my ways through that was to sort of think, uh, think about, and it was a moment where I was sort of profoundly isolated in my own life um, and was thinking about and cult like thinking about these moments of um, uh, contemplating annihilation, you know, and what that meant at a civilizational level and at a personal level. Um, and I was doing a lot of reading about different um, sort of monastic aesthetic monk figures, essentially. Um, from different points in history that were contemplating the same thing, essentially rejection or denial of self. So um, what I wound up doing was over the course of the three months that I made the sculpture, I lived as an aesthetic monk. I built my 
Uh, I built a living scenario into my studio building, which was in a warehouse alone. Um, and over the course of this entire work, I, um, and I'll go back to that, that other page in a second, but over the course of this entire work, I didn't talk to another person. I tried to limit my um, exposure to other people as much as possible. Um, I, you know, outside of going to the grocery store, I pretty much didn't see or talk to anybody. Um, I didn't um, engage in language. Um, I didn't speak, I didn't read, I didn't listen to anything that had language in it. Um, I engaged in a, a, a practice that sort of mirrored, uh, I'll show you in a bit, but mirrored um, going to these, the rules for the Byzantine icon painter that came out of a similar moment where there was an entire civilization that had a, a, a civil war about whether or not you could um, depict uh, divinity. Um, and they came up with a set of rules by which you were allowed to paint, um, allowed to make art. Uh, and they extended well beyond just sort of your average, um, you know, criteria around making. And it was, it was an entire way of life. It was a belief system that uh, and essentially it was government regulation on artists as a way to, as long as you are engaging in these rules and going through these daily practices in order to ensure that your mind and body are a conduit to the divine spirit and not your own artistic ego. That was the risk. They didn't want um, people to accidentally be praying to, um, to somebody who was trying to make a good painting rather than actually depict divinity, um, then you were allowed to make art. So I was I was sort of retrofitting these to um, to be to operate as, to essentially operate in my current context, and um, and then I would uh, essentially do all of these practices and engage in ecstatic uh, musical performance. Um, Every day, uh, sort of a drumming practice where anytime I felt myself sort of slipping into an analytical framework, I would sit down and engage in sort of meditative drumming in order to sort of, the goal was to make a work that was a self-portrait, essentially a form that I knew sort of like the back of my hand, literally, that uh, I didn't have to think uh, outside of the present moment in order to um make and that in fact I wanted to make a sculpture that was at every stage every single decision was made entirely in that present moment based on the conditions in that uh, uh, at that point so that it was essentially I was going through all of these practices to induce a fugue state where no material the other aspect and sorry another major aspect of this work is that the studio became essentially a sealed box no new material came in um, at all uh, or went out really, I saved everything. I, I had developed this uh, massive archive of material that I'd been collecting and that I've been sort of like organizing that is all like reclaimed and salvaged and material that has like really particular history and um, provenance that I could trace. And so the goal was to sort of put myself in at the sort of really edge as, far, as much as I could the edge of psychology in this sort of fugue state. Um, and so what I would do is live this life for three months. Uh, I also, this was like truly dangerous and I wouldn't recommend, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend living this way. And then actually in, uh, in retrospect, it's, uh, this, I'm doing this now. This is the only the second time I've given this lecture post pandemic. And I'm realizing like, now this has a very different resonance now that everybody has lived through like some version of this kind of isolation in, in 2020. Um, so at any rate, as I'm working on this piece, uh, the only other sort of proactive planning into the future um, decision that I do prior to starting this project is to take all this material archive and sort it all by the material that I've received as the result of an interpersonal relationship. Essentially, sorting my material archive into um, all the materials that I have collected into the things that I've received because of like through my community. These are all like the physical residue or evidence of interpersonal relationships. So if you're looking at this list, it's things like, uh, you know, like a toothbrush left in my apartment by an ex or a drum set, like all of the drum set, all the stands here are part of a drum set that was given to me by my father. Um, this piece of material right here was something given to me by my grandfather, uh, literally like these, you know, it's things that people at different points have said, hey, I think you should have this. And it 
at a point when I was experiencing profound isolation, it was like the only physical manifestation of uh, the fact that there were other, there was an extant community that I had that was out in the world that wasn't physically present at that time. Um, so I would go through this period of time, uh, or I would go through this every day and sort of, uh, you know, go through this, uh, you know, drumming practice in the morning. And the other thing I should mention is that I would edit these, um, another sort of deep tenant in aesthetic mysticism is using sound as a sort of psychological tool, um, music in particular. And so I was taking, um, I was making these soundtracks um, that were one musical phrase that would loop over and over and over. I edited them so that they would sort of loop seamlessly. Um, and I would just listen to that for the entire day. Uh, I had five to six different loops that I would run and those would really sort of like prevent uh, a kind of conscious like thought um, and really turned this into like the sort of a static fugue state. So the entire object was made this way. And so I would go in um, during the day, uh, I, I had started by leaving this table out on the ground, this table that just I found, uh, you know, in the sort of community around the studio and then ringed this table and all the material that I had that was from, uh, that was sort of given to be my, my community. And then I would do all these practices that I would sort of send me into this fugue state. And then it would really be this weird, like experience of sort of coming to at the end of the day, almost as if I had made this entire, like, you know, major moves in the sculpture entirely by, um, by chance. And so I would, like, I had made these decisions that were totally and completely blind to the sentimental uh, or historical context and that were only, you know, reacting to, oh, these, this material like operates, you know, does the contour that I need just enough to sort of suggest the figure. And then all of a sudden I would sort of come to, and it was like someone else had made this object. And all of a sudden I was seeing all these things that were arranged from my, um, my sort of like personal community that like let them be there. Um, a major source of inspiration for these were these plague figures. I was doing, I was thinking in particular about sort of the lowest moments of humanity and recorded history. And there's this really fascinating tradition of sculpture from um, immediately after the, the bubonic plague spread through Europe and Asia. Um, these are these sculptures called personifications of death. And you see it across cultures that were sort of touched by the Black Death, which was like, sort of major precipitating event of, of societal collapse. Um, and there are these sculptures where you have essentially what amounts to like classical figuration that's carved, but then wherever there's not, you know, but then wherever there is skin, it's classical sort of figuration, but then, you know, there is just literally the sort of viscera of the body. Because at this point, up until this point, death had always been represented as allegorical. Uh, as like an old man in a robe or an hourglass scythe, it was something that was sort of tied to religious um, metaphor. Uh, but post Black Death, I mean, everybody from Portugal to Vietnam and China knew what the like sort of material reality of death was because there wasn't a person who probably hadn't seen uh, a, a decomposing corpse. Um, and so death could no longer be figurative. It had to be a literal. So there's this sort of tradition that describes this trauma. Um, so anyways, that was sort of a lot of the sort of structure of this was rooted in that moment. I'm gonna skip through some of these. Um, are there any questions about this work? I'm not quite sure how I would know them. If people did have questions. You can, you can unmute yourselves if you have a question okay, for cool. Taylor, yeah. Um, I was curious, <clears throat> can you guys hear me okay? Okay, um, I'm curious if or how much you're considering color palette when you're collecting objects to include, I mean, it sounds like you're doing this mostly unconsciously, so to the, is it just sort of chance? Yeah, in part, um, and I should say that, uh, yeah, in part, it's, it's, it's by chance, although there was a moment where, like, the archive, there's all sorts of, like, latent meaning that's embedded in this archive like in, in part it's the implicit bias of what I was collecting which there was a really significant moment for me at least graduating from graduate school where I um I re there was I mean I'm sure you guys can sort of identify with this but up until that point I'd only ever made work in an institutional context and so I was used to 
constantly communicating about the work before it was it had happened, while it was happening, right after it had happened, a year or two after it had happened. And I had totally internalized a sort of um, really pretty wicked like uh, justification criteria where like I had to understand the sort of content and meaning behind a decision in order to make it rather, you know, before I could make it, I had to be able to explain it to myself. Um, in part so that I was anticipating the next faculty or, you know, other grad student who came in that I would then have to explain why I was doing something to because like institutions are, you know, you're kind of going there in part to be at the center of this like panopticon machine that just gives you attention and you internalize that attention. You constantly think about how you're going to communicate about this. But there's a really particular kind of idea that if you have to, if you put the pressure of justification on it, um, before it's really like, it's had time to sort of grow out of a fragile infancy, it'll collapse. Um, whereas later, if you let it, if you give it some time to, for you to not understand it and you don't ask it to explain itself to you, um, it can really grow into something robust and weird and actually tell you something about how you're thinking that you didn't already know. Um, and that isn't, you're not contriving from scratch in order to explain to yourself. One of those for me was color. So everything in grad school, um, you know, I would sort of, color is something that oftentimes like defies that kind of, of linguistic justification or like that, you know, an analytic framework because it operates at, at a sensory level and an emotional level. And for me, at least at the level of pleasure um, and pleasure became really important, a really important layer in the work post grad school that I couldn't describe while I was in grad school. Right. So like if I found I, I found myself being really attracted to these sort of like hot pink or like really keyed up high saturation colors and I couldn't understand or articulate why outside of I like it. And for me, I had learned that I like it was uh, a sign that uh, the reason wasn't enough and I couldn't do it as opposed to much later, you know, and I'm sort of saving the longer version of this, but much later where I realized that like me liking something as an artist and any artist, I feel like that your brain is giving you that serotonin or dopamine hit to tell you the way that your brain's been programmed and structured by your place in like history and gender and race and culture and class and everything, the way that, you know, is embedded in it, something to say about this, uh, this like phenomena or this quality like you have something you've uh, there's a perspective on this that like your brain is a tool to unlock um and that little hit is something to dig further if you're in, if you're drawn towards something and you like something and if it feels like you like you're compulsively drawn towards it that's a sign to dig deeper um and that actually the project itself can help you understand why uh you like it you know and so liking it is enough of a reason for me now is, is the reason to move forward but also is never enough to sit on, right? Like it's the project itself becomes you examining and interrogating that for yourself. Does that make sense? So like a lot of pleasure in the experience of the object, particularly because a lot of, you know, hopefully we'll, I can get to it, but a lot of the the content and material is really, it winds up being really dense and in some sometimes challenging that like the, at a material level, it's super important to me that there's pleasure involved. And at least at this point for me, that that meant high, like this high key, high saturation color, which was sort of what was drawing as I was walking around, you know, grabbing things, picking things up, saving things. That was part of what did it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I really appreciate that sentiment. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I forgot to mention this. The head is um, four years worth of wood glue poured over and over again over a, a, actually a fly. There is a fly at the center. I put a fly on a dowel and then as an experiment without an intentionality, just poured wood glue um, in increasing uh, quality. The, the core is the low quality, the, the outside is the highest quality wood glue. Because I, at the time, one of my day jobs was I was the shop tech at a wood shop um, at a school that I taught at. And so every day, or every semester, all the freshmen would buy wood glue, and then they would all leave it in the shop, and they wouldn't take it with them. And so I had this, uh, you know, through this sort of burgeoning practice of trying to uh, rethink ways of making around taking advantage of what you have. Um, I was sort of trying to, you know, figure out what do I do with this material, and, and then it wound up years later, uh, sort of working its way into this sculpture. Um, okay, cool. So this work um, is. This, I, this work is the densest thing that I've ever sort of reference wise, the densest thing that I've ever done. 
I think too much so to the extent where it's totally incomprehensible, but um, I enjoy talking about it. Um, and so I will uh, uh, try to sort of describe a few things, but also this uh, this work in particular, I sort of had a major reaction to later on in terms of like sort of an effort to make things less dense, more straightforward you know, and, and simpler in fact. This work, so if this work is me sort of exploring um, the strategies of um, uh, religious, spiritual, or mystic prophecy uh, in order to sort of divine the future and sort of constructing a life based around that belief and let the object just be a sort of byproduct of that belief. This in particular is me, um, I started to get really interested in financial markets as a mode of divination and future prediction, and in particular futures markets. Um, and so this work's titled The Oracle. Um, and uh, it's, there are seri it's, it sort of represents a body of research that it gets pretty convoluted, but it is uh, throughout this period of time, I sort of operated by a number of different belief. I, I sort of cultivated a similar sort of set of education and belief system living of um, financial futures markets trading and um, uh, divination using uh, the I Ching, actually, random chance, which is sort of built uh, a sort of divination method from um, ancient China based on uh, random sort of chance operations, which I was sort of equating with the um, futures market trading. So as part of this project, actually, before I talk about the references, I will show you a video of this work because there's a sort of kinetic element in this work. Um, Okay, can you guys see that? Cool. So when you walk in, you hear that sound. It's a 40 minute long audio track that sort of pulses in and out. And that audio track um, is an electrical signal that is pushing through, I can't point at the screen, you can't see me, uh, is, is actually cycling through all of these wires. So these wires are a circuit that run through the entire piece. Uh, it's an electrical signal that when it hits the speakers is expressed as a sound, that sort of buzzing sound that you hear. When it hits this oscilloscope in the bass, uh, you actually, it's what's driving that waveform that you're seeing, which is a visualization of the, the audio signal. When it hits this sculptural television right here, um, this television is actually a, a light box um, that has a series of LEDs and two-way mirror and the lights fade in and out. They fade in and out in accordance. Each one is sort of programmed to a different uh, frequency in that sound, uh, 40,000 Hertz, 20,000 Hertz, et cetera. And when it hits that, they, it pulses in and out with that sound. Uh, when the audio track gets quiet, this uh, television fades all the way out and you just see a mirror and you see yourself. When the lights come on, you see deep into this television and it goes way back. Um, and it's sort of a television that is a recreation that you can see, this is what it looks like when it's dark. Um, as part of this sculpture, I bought um, futures uh, stock in this particular economic uh, zone in China called the Guangzhou uh, Special Economic or Special Economic Zone. Yeah, the Guangzhou Special Economic Zone, which is a sort of city based around um, several warehouses, like massive warehouses, much like Foxconn, who produce all the Apple products um, that produce um, essentially corporate or uh, commercial widgets, just commercial material. Uh, and in particular, one of the things that they produce are plastic blow mold um, objects. So this little lemon here is part of um, a uh, the, the output of a factory that I bought uh, stock in, in the sort of larger economic zone it was in, and it produced these things that had just at the time become available for purchase on Alibaba, which now is like an old, you know, sort of relatively familiar website. But at the time, it was sort of radical that it was a platform that um, 
the Chinese government was subsidizing that cut out uh, global distributors and let you just buy directly from uh, factory owners, manufacturers in China. And so um, I bought stocks and then I purchased a number of um, objects from those factories, these lemons, lemon here, and then there's some fake ice cubes that I can point out later. Um, and so what that audio is, is uh, I took um, the reason why I was interested in that particular um, economic zone is because I don't know if you guys remember in, oh God, it was 2000, oh shoot, I used to have all of this off the top of my head and I believe it was 2014, there was a flash crash uh, of the stock market where over the span of a minute, 30 seconds, um, the stock market shot up and then shot down and crashed and then stabilized. And people were trying to figure out what it was. And essentially it was high frequency algorithmic trading. It was software bots that trade at micro second. They trade at fractions of a second at fractions of a cent. They buy and sell 130 times a second um, in order to make micro profits. They, it was this moment where these, um, these high frequency algorithmic trading bots crashed the market because they formed a rogue wave um, and bought and sold and they, they uh, shot the skyrocket of the, process, the, the price up and crashed it. And one of the stock indexes that they were trading on was this stock market, uh, this uh, Guangzhou special economic district. And so the sound, when I was reading about that, I realized that buying and selling at 130 times a second is a waveform. Uh, and as like, you know, positive, negative, just like an audio waveform. And in fact, 130 times a second is in the audible frequency. So this, a lot of this project started as me hearing about that and thinking about the futures market and speculation on divining the future through finances. And uh, I took that, that sound, and let me see if I can find the image, took that sound. This is an image from those algorithmic trading where they crashed the market. Uh, I took that, that waveform from the bots trading and actually plugged it into an audio program to create that sound. So that sound that you're hearing is actually the sound of the market, which Taylor, at the time, um, yeah. We couldn't hear the sound in your video. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, so I, it has to do with like, when you share your screen, you have to like click optimize for screen sharing or something like that. So you might have to stop the share and then reshare and see those options. Oh, got it. That's terrible. Okay, so stop the share. And then now try to again. share again and a dialogue should like pop up and say like, or there's like two check share boxes. Share sound. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Bing bong. Okay. How about this? Can you hear this? Okay. So the, the video has sound but actually I'll, I'll, play the, I'll play the video again you guys can hear that Great, okay. So what that is, is uh, the sound of the market. The sound of a single day, a single um, minute of high frequency algorithm, it's actually 40 minutes, um, but it, it, co it covers the sort of period of this event of emergent swarm, uh, essentially intelligence by these high frequency algorithmic bots, um, transcoded into um, the audio spectrum. One of the things that I learned while doing this, I was also sort of experimenting with different sort of audio, still coming off of the previous project, ways of using audio as a way to shape your thinking. Um, and was doing a lot of research into the pseudoscience of like delta waves and using soundtracks, uh, sound to like input waveforms into your brain because it, your ear is literally a tool that takes oscillation from your environment and turns it into a brain wave. Um, and so I, in doing this research, realize, you know, also realized that um, the sort of supposed uh, scientific root of the ohm frequency from uh, meditation, Buddhist meditation, comes from uh, 
is actually 130 hertz. It, it is right at the same frequency that these bots are trading at. And so through this pro audio process um, called convolution, or just a physical process of audio, if you mix two waveforms together, where their values are the same, it they cancel each other out if you invert one. And so what this audio is, is actually, and you can see it in the waveform here, is actually um, everywhere where the audio drops out and flickers like that is exactly where the market and the ohm frequency align. And so throughout the entirety of this work, I am, I am playing this track that you're hearing. It's a 40 minute track and every day as I'm working on it, I'm listening to it um, on a loop. And you can actually see it in this. If you can see the way that this waveform down here is moving through that, the other waveform, that is the ohm frequency moving through the market. Anyway, okay. Does that like rel make sort of relative sense, at least as much as it's possible? Cool. So anyways, this serves as the site of research. I use this sort of like this moment in history and the sort of intersecting sites of uh, Guangzhou Special Economic District and the stock exchange and the history of sort of exchange and flow between um, these moments as a way of these places, New York and, and uh, Guangzhou as a way of thinking about exchange and belief systems. And so um, as part of that, over the course of this work, I start um, also letting my decision-making process on this work be dictated by uh, the I Ching, and in particular using the I Ching, uh, translations of the I Ching into English. Um, the I Ching being a signal, a source, a text used for divining the future for ancient Chinese rulers starting in the fourth century BC, um, you know, well before China was sort of a singular construct um, that it is now. And, uh, and it's a text that includes translation as an essential element of its text. So it's been like, it was written in t uh, the fourth century BC and then in the second century AD, Confucius wrote, wrote commentary that is now baked into the text. And you can, uh, there are roughly 25 to 30 different um, uh, English translations of it. So over the course of this work, thinking about sort of exchange of transmission of a signal between East and West, I collected, um, I was traveling a lot. I would go to every used bookstore in every city or every place that I was in um, and collect every translation and copy of the I Ching that I could find and used it as a way to sort of essentially um, direct, I would, I would consult it for advice. It's also referred to as the Oracle um, traditionally, which is where the title of this comes from. I would consult it for strategies for continuing on this project. Um, and so I would throw uh, divine, you can throw coins. So I would throw coins every morning to divine the future. As I'm also doing this, I'm also uh, this, the uh, using, um, data visualization techniques to sort of organize the sort of principles in this work. So one of the things about financial news and financial markets is that there's also this sort of deep history of data visualization um, as a way of trying to sort of parse otherwise incomprehensible signals. Um, this is from CNBC, you guys were pretty familiar with the sort of like the, the, the um, visual construction of sort of financial news, the aesthetic regimen of it, which is sort of one more of power than it is of explanation. Um, that is sort of the basic principle of this. And so actually, as this was going on, I started getting deeper and deeper into researching data visualization and I um, and the way that it's used as a sort of like tool in financial markets and financial news um, and realized that the, the sort of like godfather of data visualization techniques in schools uh, teaches in Boston and I was in Providence at the time and actually ran seminars on data visualization. So I uh, went and took his course on data visualization and used those tools in order to make this sort of like abstracted and comprehensible version of data visualization to sort of try to describe this market. And in particular, um, this part, this is where it really gets off into the weeds. So I'm gonna really try to make this like as quick as possible because it really, you know, winds up just turning into noise at a certain point. But the beginning of data visualization uh, in a traditional contemporary sense and the way that it's used now was started in the 1860s in France. There's this 
as I was doing this research, all of these super nerdy data visualizers are obsessed with this first iteration of multiple data sets being described visually by Charles Menard, where he tries to describe Napoleon, uh, Napoleon's March on Moscow, which again was another moment of sort of a conflict between, uh, you know, cross continent um, that was similar to this sort of uh, circuit that was happening between the futures market, except this was between France and Moscow, but it's a sort of similar circuit. And this is the first time where um, multiple data sets, in this case, six different data sets are being described in one graphic, like location, size of his army, temperature. But I was struck that this is sort of this moment where essentially what he's trying to describe is the significant loss of life. This is the size of like Napoleon's army leaving to Moscow, and this is the size coming back. And it's essentially depicting uh, half a million people dying. And trying to des describe the enormity of that. And one of the things that data visualizers like to do is they constantly remake this graphic over and over and over again as this weird fetish object. And so that is actually the graphic is it's a history of data visualization in this piece is it's the original Charles Menard map and then every single one subsequently after that. Um, I'm going to try to move forward because it's getting more and more complex, but a lot of these objects um, in the work are also different objects that come from different moments on the circuit that this sort of like loop happens, right? So these are a lot of these objects are coming from the different economic zones that were represented by the stock. Um, that was, I was then tracking like as it went day by day, um, how it did in terms of uh, in the futures market and its value and then sort of encoding that value into the work. And then also the library of I Ching translations that I was using. Um, oh, right. The last thing, these are the different sort of marks on, on the I Ching. You, when you throw the I Ching, it gives you a graphic representation that you can then look up in the book that then advises you on how to sort of uh, respond to whatever question you're asking it. But it operates as these series of lines and dashes and different um, coordination. And one of the things that, oh, and then the final, at the end of the work, I threw a final iteration, a final question to ask about the future of this work and then cast it in the top of, uh, so it's the sort of there permanently in this resin pool. And then the answer is written on the back of it. Um, and in particular, um, one of the things that I asked it as I was going about this, there's also, I was uh, researching the history of the Silk Road as another moment of a circuit across sort of Europe and Asia and into, um, yeah, across, or Europe and Asia that sort of represented the same circuit. Um, and do any of you guys know uh, Otzi the Iceman? Have you heard about this figure? Otzi the Iceman is a Neolithic, essentially in the 90s, um, some climbers in the Italian Alps found a body frozen in the glacier. Uh, they thought it and took it out and it turned out to be a Neolithic um, hunter that had been frozen in this glacier for 15,000 years. Um, and the sort of conventional wisdom is that he was actually a sort of nomadic hunter who was essentially working through this same circuit that you know, tracked along what would later become the Silk Road. Um, and one of the fascinating things about this figure, so basically his head, a recreation of his head is embedded in the side of the speaker. The speaker is also sort of retrofitted. It was a speaker that I found salvaged on the street outside of my studio one day and sort of made its way into the work. Um, and so it's a recreation of a bust of Otzi. And one of the things sort of the recent discoveries about Otzi is that he had all of these tattoos across his body that were all falling in line with the sort of graphic representation from the I Ching um, or similar to it. But also um, these were sort of stick and poke tattoos done with ash and water that were over the, the best sort of scholarship at this point says that they were sort of maps towards uh, a medical practice, uh, something like acupuncture. And these were all tattoos that were over sites of chronic injury. Um, and so one of the things as a sort of connection to all of this, his head goes into the sort of, his, a bust of him goes into the base of the sculpture in this sort of infinity mirror box. And then all of the injuries that I experienced over the course of this work, um, I wound up, um, using ash from materials from the sculpture to then also tattoo over the same site. So that was one of the things I sort of pulled the I Ching about whether or not it would, I should do this. And I, at one point I was working on this, I severed my tendon uh, and nerve on this finger. And then once it healed, um, as it was healing, I sort of did a similar mode of tattoo over it. Um, and there's a couple other ones. Um, 
cool. Anyways, so that my experience with that work was that it was sort of one of the densest things that I've ever made. Regretted it mostly, but wanted to show you guys uh, the sort of that the density of that work. Um, any questions about that before I move on? Cool. All right, so the next one, this is the sort of last one in this body of work that I'll show you guys. And this one thankfully is faster to sort of describe. Um, but this is uh, a work titled The Haru Specs. Does anybody know what Haru Specs is or what a Haru Specs is? No? It's a strategy no. of divinity. <laughs> nice. Um, it's a strategy of divination uh, that is um, from, uh, it sort of expresses itself across cultures um, in, in ancient sort of prehistoric era in particular that we've got a lot of references to from um, ancient Etruscan and um, uh, Assyrian and Babylonian era, but it's, it's basically the practice of divining the future by reading um, animal entrails, uh, in particular like livers of sheep or uh, of birds in particular. Uh, the person who told Caesar, like, beware the Ides of March was his uh, uh, Harvest who read the, the, a bird liver and then told him this period of time is not auspicious for you. And so um, over the course of this work, um, essentially this work is a recreation of um, a wandering albatross made entirely out of material that's been salvaged from different sites of climate, um, like small scale regional, but sites of climate devastation devastation or um, emergency. So in particular, I was in Vermont when there was catastrophic floods in Lake Champlain and collected a lot of material there. Um, I was at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts and collected uh, a lot of the plastic detritus that was sort of coming off of international shipping lanes. Um, there were a number of boat fleets that had been wrecked in hurricanes um, that I gathered the sort of plexiglass windows to. Um, in the coast of Massachusetts from whale watching fleets that the, the wings are made out of plexiglass from these boats um, that had been wrecked in uh, sort of catastrophic hurricanes. All of these sort of small moments, uh, relatively speaking small in that they weren't Katrina level, um, you know, climate disasters, but also nonetheless, like sort of the everyday climate disasters of sort of creeping climate change. And so this is a recreation of the body of a wandering albatross, which is the sort of world's largest bird, um, thinking that, okay, I'm going to sort of enact this reading of a bird liver, um, teach myself this practice of haruspicy, of divination, uh, this ancient practice, and then read this bird liver to sort of, if you're going to, some kind of a dumb thought, like if you're going to ask the biggest question about the future and the unknown, thinking about climate, stain, climate change and ecological collapse, then it needs to be the biggest bird. Um, and uh, so I sort of made this body from the inside out, including the organs out of all of this material that had been touched by dev you know, ecological devastation and then pulled out the livers and sort of tried to figure out a way that I could read them. Um, so, you know, an example of some of the materiality of this, the wings and a lot of the sort of stick material here are made from trees that had been downed um, in flooding that had you know, been uh, from areas of forest that had been flooded in Lake Champlain that I collected. Um, it's tied to, oh, and then also um, uh, the sort of wishbone here was made out of trees that had been struck by lightning from uh, storms uh, that had come through Arizona uh, that were sort of unseasonal and sort of associated with climate change when I was visiting there. So there's like trees that have been exploded by lightning, sort of plastic detritus, um, and then uh, the chains all come from this jewelry, dead stock jewelry supply warehouse that had been flooded um, in Vermont um, from when Irene came through. Um, and flew inwards. Um, and then all of it is made, is tied to this um, PA speaker that sort of uh, a manifestation of a PA speaker that I made uh, and then cast the speakers out of cement. And then as they were setting, I um, recited uh, the, there's electromagnets in them and I recited the rhyme of the ancient mariner into them. Uh, and so those vibrations are recorded in the speaker. The rhyme of the ancient mariner is a kind of you know, well-known transcendentalist um, poem, or uh, tra transcendentalist poem that is essentially an allegory about the natural world um, as sort of 
superseding Christianity. But there's the, that's where the phrase albatross around your neck is a, uh, comes from as a way, as a sort of penance. Um, and then also at this time, uh, I was also looking at a lot of these images of albatross chicks that were dying in sort of mass quantities from ingesting plastic um, from the uh, ocean shipping channels. Um, so they would ingest them as the, you know, the sort of mothers would go fly out, catch fish, ingest all of this plastic from the garbage in the ocean, and then spit it up and feed it to these, um, these chicks who would then die from literally bursting from the inside out. Um, which is sort of the logic behind what these are made. Um, and then so lastly, uh, and just to show you uh, some of the sort of historical precedents, you know, her specific the idea is that um, ancient cultures were realizing that there was some benefit to being able to, there were some uh, uh, ways that reading the interior of animals and sort of learning and becoming attuned to like blemishes and swelling and sort of the shape of their organs could tell you things about the future. The way that we know this is because there are these like um, livers and, and clay tablets and things that were salvaged um, that, uh, or sort of that were found in archeological remains that show uh, sort of the sites of um, how they like the sort of practice. There are these like test livers. This was a liver to use to train, uh, you know, sort of young diviners. And so if there was like a blemish in this zone in sort of, you know, Venus's or Jupiter's zone, then that meant, you know, this for the future versus this. And it sounds like sort of uh, mysticism that we can't quite put stock in, but it is actually for an agrarian society, the thing that uh, is the most important to know about the future, about the unknown of the future is actually climate related. It's, you know, are we gonna have a wet year, or a dry year? Are we gonna have, um, you know, how should we go about um, planting? Because this is sort of the period of the agricultural revolution where um, decisions about how the weather went and how you planted would literally mean the sort of life or death of your entire like civilization. And so it turns out that, um, animal organs are actually sensitive to shifts in weather and barometric pressure um, that can actually deliver you scientific information about how what weather patterns are gonna happen and how the growing season is gonna go. And so it's actually like a deep seated indigenous knowledge. Um, there just wasn't clarity on what the limits of that not like future divination practice was. So there is a, one book on the subject written by a contemporary Druid, Reverend Robert Lee Ellison, who lives in upstate New York, who sort of uh, gone through the archeology span and taught. So I taught myself this practice over the course of this and then remade sort of manifestations of the liver out of material from these sort of ecological disasters. And then uh, did a process of manual MRI where I sort of made these objects from the inside out. These are video stills of these objects. Made the objects from the inside out and then sliced um, away, uh, you know, planed away the surface of these objects a thousandth of an inch at a time and photographed in between each time to essentially make a stop motion animation through these objects that amount to like a manual MRI. Um, and it's all sort of plastic detritus from this particular um, ecological zone. So I can show you that video real quick. Um, these are two bowls um, that are essentially stand-ins for the liver. They're very short, like 45 second animations. So this is sort of descending dimensionally down through the objects. And there's no sound, but accompanying this sculptural work are these two videos. And I'll just sort of screen through real quick, just to give you a sense. And then these are just on an infinite loop backwards and forwards so that they're sort of perpetually showing you their interior. And then the other one, and so this was a stand-in for the liver 
making this video, then I would project it or, uh, on a video monitor in the space and essentially read the video animation through a performance to sort of divine the future according to um, uh, the sort of tradition of high respects from the sort of Mediterranean region. Uh, you can see there's moments where sort of like forms fade in into legibility and then out of legibility. Like this is, uh, I don't know if you can tell this is like the side of sunglasses. There's like a clip to a backpack that's sort of a familiar form and bottle caps and, you know, a lot of the kind of things that you would find in the Gulf Stream. So I'll scroll through this. Again, it fades in and out as a sort of, you know, investigation into the interiority of this. Um, Eller, got it. Um, then, we're at 5.15 now. Um, yeah, I that know. is it. <laughs> oh, that's the it. That's it. That's the yeah. end. Oh, I thought you had Well, other... there's another, there's another. Oh. They were thinking of showing. Another body of work, but we can, you know, given that we're over time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if that. you want to scroll through some stuff and then just sure. um, allow for, if people have questions you want to pop in, I know, um, yeah, Parker, totally. Parker wrote something in the chat, but he actually just had to leave. I, he was in the Got room it. with me. Um, but yeah, if anybody has questions for Taylor that wants to just unmute yourself. Um, and yeah, I have a question. Um, Taylor, I was just wondering if you could speak to what draws you to use these like ancient, like rooted in the past technologies for divination, like what's that what is it that's like pulling you to use these things today um because you're presenting them in such an interesting way and yeah that's my yeah question. yeah I mean I think that in particular um historical frameworks and continuity is something that at least for me like helps orient me in time and space. And in particular, I'm really fascinated with the way that materials collect and accumulate. Like materials persist through history and are shaped by it. Um, it leaves its mark on them. And so the, the way that those, like reading materials and thinking about sort of the long deep geologic history of materials becomes something that, um, at least early on in my practice really helped me like understand and like anchor myself in it. And so looking to history for those kinds of things is a way to sort of like superimpose and filter contemporary experience through it um, helps me to like frame and situate. There was a moment, you know, I think there was the question about color and in particular, one of the moments in like my studio right after I finished grad school that really was the foundation for a lot of that um, work and the way of thinking about color was this moment where I was like really, really drawn towards this hot pink fluorescent plexiglass and wanted to make something out of it, but couldn't quite explain to myself why I didn't have a reason for it. It outside of like compulsion and sort of a sensory pleasure, but I couldn't explain it to myself like that at the time. And it was the one time where I, you know, you know, it was the first time where I just let myself, I, I was about to make something out of it and then I stopped myself. And the reason, and I stopped myself because I was like, well, I can't do it because I don't have a reason for it other than just liking the color and that's not enough. And so I'm gonna wait. And then I realized like, wait, I am, I am, no one is gonna see this. I am in a warehouse alone It's the middle of the night. There's no professor, there's no other grad school. Nobody else is gonna come through here. Um, and in fact, I couldn't, I probably couldn't get somebody in here if I wanted to, let alone like, you know, sort of against my wishes. Like I can let myself do this. And it was through, letting myself do that and then thinking through like what why am I compelled by this material like what is it I started thinking about doing research and thinking you know and, and and you know the project became a platform for me to think about like oh well actually this color of material is so keyed up and so like tapping into our sort of like 
evolutionary monkey brain that's prone towards, you know, com being compulsively drawn towards color because it didn't exist prior to like 1961. And why not well, it was because the pet petrochemical industry uh, and technology hadn't uh, sort of developed to the, it's a new technology. It's a technology that's new to geologic history that can produce a color that wasn't like, that was only rarely possible through natural, uh, you know, selection, um, if, if at all. And, uh, and what is that like petrochemical material? Like it is that, and you know, doing that research into like, oh, it is actually like, how is this possible? It is actually the dead bodies of like massive algal blooms from, you know, prehistoric oceans that evolved before microbes had evolved that could eat cellulose because plants as a living thing were so new, you know, in the same way that plastics are new to the planet now and there's no, um, microbes that have evolved to consume them, cellular, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like that kind of deep and thinking like, oh, literally the atoms in this object. Like if I think about their, the, the, the physical reality of their history and passage through time, like it actually helps describe this to me and the work that I was making at the time wound up becoming kind of primarily about that atomic history of the materials. Um, from that experience. And that that anchor point, that grounding in history is the thing that helped me frame it. So in part, like all of this work was also like, you'll notice happened like from the 20, 2015 to 2017, which in the US was a particularly fraught time. It still is, it's even more so now, but at the time it was the 2016 election. It was, um, there was a tremendous amount of anxiety about unknown futures. And so living with and thinking about the unknown in ways of, in, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that at least helped for me is like, okay, how have we collectively dealt with the unknown? How have we collectively dealt with fear from not knowing and how do we become comfortable with not knowing? And in fact, like the possible reality of like decline and decay, which is what we were thinking a lot about during this time. And we still are, it's only gotten more so. Um, and so I, it's some, maybe it's compulsive. I, there's like a, a way that I can't, there's a certain point where it becomes irreducible where it's like something about my position in gender and race and class and time and history has programmed my brain to like find grounding in historical frameworks. But that's, that's what I have. That kind of understanding is what I have to um, provide to like sort of our cultural canon. Thank you. That was incredibly wonderfully stated. Yay! Yeah. Bouncing <laughs> off of that, actually, I got a, I have a question from uh, Craig Dongowski. He had to leave as well, but he sent this to me. He said, um, I'm curious if he has ever worked with or shared his work with people that use divination. I think Nietzsche said that there are two types of people, those who want to know and those who want to believe. I'm interested in knowing in how hmm. much he believes. That is a wild quote to pull out. Well, that's Craig Dongowski. Sort of <laughs> you know? yeah, that's pretty good. That's very, very good. Yeah. Um, the question was whether I believe. I if you've that's such worked a with wild. people like Divin. Oh, diviners. if I've worked with actual. Well, if you've uh, worked with diviners. them, and yeah, if you're if you believe it or not. Yeah. The harder question to answer is whether I believe it because I feel like one of the things that you have to do as an artist is get your brain to be as, or at least what I became really interested in this project is really, and you guys probably identify with this in grad school, is like really be able to question what feels irreducible and concrete and break it into its constituent pieces and then question that and break it into its con constituent pieces. And so much of being an artist, I feel like is, experimenting with occupying perspectives and shifting perspectives constantly, like truly like inhabiting one framework and then fully extricating yourself and inhabiting a different one. Um, to the point where it became like, and it was maybe kind of over this period that it, like I actually, I feel like increasingly convinced over this course of work and also just the way that American culture, which I'm situated in is operating, is that it is entirely possible to work your way towards any kind of belief given the right context. Um, and that your mind is entirely, like my mind is entirely plastic and flexible and that 
I guess the answer is that during the course, I like, I'm sort of primarily agnostic about everything because I believe that you can, you can inhabit any belief that your brain is flexible and fluid enough to sort of like situate yourself in any kind of belief. As I was working on this project, uh, many of these projects, I mean, I have a number of people in my life sort of already incidentally who engage in different kinds of divination, um, whether it's sort of financial trading, futures trading um, in economics, or, you know, I have some friends uh, who are practicing shamans um, from different traditions. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've definitely talked to people. There's no uh, higher specs around, at least as much as I could find. It's like really kind of rare, except for this one guy in upstate New York, who's a, like a contemporary druid, who was really um, most everything for me. But yeah, I mean, I think the flexibility and the fluidity of outlook and how permeable and malleable it is and how you can truly get yourself to believe anything. Um, it's funny because just in talking about this now, I'm realizing the connection of that with sort of, um, you know, the kind of mass fugue state that can happen and that has happened. Um, and the mass sort of like diversion, diverging in belief structures that's happened in the US that was happening that the roots were sort of coming to fruit during exactly this period of time, you know, that this work was being made. Which is wild, that connection. I, I mean, I am a firm believer that like our brains, that our brains are texts that are shaped by culture, the culture that we're situated in. And that, you know, a lot of my job or in a lot of what I believe sort of the artist's job is or can be is to sort of like extract all of the things that are in your brain that you don't know are there, that culture put there through your sort of social programming um, and sort of embed them in, in objects that you're making to then read as texts outside of you to understand like, you know, the larger culture around you, the subject of some of this work in some ways winds up being autobiographical or coming from my life, but, but not because that's the end goal is to sort of just describe that, but because it's actually essential to, to dredge that stuff up to see what lives there. And I feel like even, you know, ideas of inherent bias, the things that, you know, sort of culture puts in our brains that we don't know is there, that we didn't decide goes there, um, sort of is, falls in line with that way of thinking. And that it's up to us to sort of pull that out and read it in order to report on our, cult, our, 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 you know, sort of unique niche and culture and perspective on, in our culture and society. Cool. For sure, yeah. Um, also, uh, so Parker was wondering, I mean, he had to jump off, but um, he was wondering, and this is, I'm actually curious about this too, uh, what type of information or abstract do you normally provide um, with the audience with, like, especially for the Oracle, since it's so dense? Yeah, man, that thing. Um, it, uh, so I, the material list, First and foremost, I'm super interested in using the materialist as a, almost as a mode of poetry. Um, in the past, I've used um, footnotes to materialist. I kind of stopped doing that um, for various reasons, but in an earlier body of work, I would footnote every entry into the materialist. And then in the footnote, it would describe some salient information about its provenance or history or, the, or how it came to be in the work and what, what, how, that orient, how, how that origin inflected the meaning but I would always put that information and still do put that information in a zine form along with sort of drawings and other ephemera that sort of relate to the work that um, I provide at every um, exhibition so that there's some way, one, so that it's not um, the sort of primary like didactic driver of meaning in the work. If it's on the wall, I feel like you can sort of run into this experience where it feels like required understanding in order to you know experience the work which i'm actually much more interested in and sort of devoted to the sort of physical phenomenological sensation of the work and experience of it in real time as being the sort of primary framework for everything um, i don't want it to i don't want someone to feel the experience of looking at something and then looking at the materialist and then thinking oh I didn't get it and now I do. Like, I love it when it can explicate and deepen and enlong, like a sort of enliven and lengthen the tail of the work as it sort of flips and mutates and changes in your mind when you realize that like, 
oh, this is made out of this, and you know, this material is extinct heart pine, and this material is like, uh, you know, a fossilized ocean floor, etc. Um, so the materialist is a big part of it. Also, I've really, in particular, tried to engage in non-commercial exhibition settings. Um, where there's a different kind of engagement by the artist. And in particular, I've tried to do uh, a lot of recently in the last four or five years, um, shows at colleges and universities where um, the, my role is sort of you know, more engaged than, um, than being, uh, you know, than, than just being the object, where I can come and do lectures, where I can come and do studio visits and work, and it becomes more of a social environment as well. So like the other answer is actually lectures. Like a lot of times um, the last like four sort of significant exhibitions that I've had have had some form of lecture engagement associated with them as part of the programming. Um, yeah. And then, but yeah, zines in particular, I think it's really important that, especially if the work is for sale, that um, then there are free zines that anybody can take with them too. So that the sort of like hierarchy of being able to take work home with you is not exclusively commercial. I mean, it ultimately is, and I have real qualms about having work for sale, period. Um, for my own reasons, I don't necessarily blame anybody for doing that, but for my own, for my own, sort of frameworks and it feels weird. So if it ever is for sale, there has to be a free zine with sort of reproductions of original artwork in it. That's really cool. Does anybody else have um, questions? Just chime in. It's okay if not. I also, no. I just, it is classic that I, I'm never, I'm never able to finish a lecture. It always happens. But I'd be, if anybody's interested in this uh, newer body of work, especially if we're doing a studio visit or something, I'm, I'm also super happy to talk about it or show images of it real quick. Yeah, no, people were like, oh my gosh, 45 minute studio visits. <laughs> I was like, well, Taylor, we'll, we'll talk for a bit. <laughs> I'll try not to. I'll try not to. Well, I don't have any questions, but I have a comment, and I just wanted to say that this was so like uh, serendipitously or synchronistically like aligned in so many ways, and so so interesting. Um, just in general, to hear about your work and hear you talk about your work, and for you to be so mindful of us as a graduate student audience to almost tailor the talk to us and um oh yeah for sure really heartfelt thank you um oh for that's awesome and talking about your work um yeah sad i'm not having a studio visit but i'll i'll interrogate my my uh cohort about theirs <laughs> well you can always send an email too um my email is taylor baldwin studio it's on my website it's taylor baldwin studio at gmail.com but i'm happy to um even engage over email. I mean, like I said, like being an educator and, and having some kind of engagement beyond just beyond making work as an artist with people and communicating is is really important. I think for all of us, but you know, for me in, in particular, as a parallel a parallel creative practice. And so, I really value the opportunity to have your guys's attention at all. And if you have any interest in like even communicating over email, I'm available. Thank you so much, and I I will because I'll I'd like to talk to you more about. Uh you're presenting your work at like colleges and universities. It's an interesting totally. for me too. So thanks again. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Where Where is your next show, Taylor? The one you're installing in a week? It's installing in a week. It is, uh, it is at International Waters Gallery in, um, which is a project, a weird DIY project space in Brooklyn um, uh -huh. that, is I'm super excited about. It's a former brewery from the turn of the century that has these weird vaulted ceilings. And it's in Bushwick and the objects in the, the, um, in the show are entirely made from material spanning a 420 million year history from that neighborhood. So yeah. it's like the you know fossil ocean floor of the lime cement that was made to make the sidewalk and then like smelted pewter from stuff left on the street, et cetera, things like that. But it's in Bushwick, Brooklyn. 
um, at International Waters Gallery, which is a new sort of nonprofit project space that just started up. Cool. Yeah. What are those eyes made out of on this piece oh, here? I'm so I'm so glad you asked. Um, the eyes are made. <laughs> these are um, the short version is that these are skulls that are that come from a online database of cancer imaging of people who have donated their cancer CT scans um, to the NIH. They've been stripped and anonymized. And I, from working with my mom, who's a she's a nurse who does work in brain cancer. Um, I, she asked me to help her with this, which is how I found out about this, but figured out a way to make 3D models of the skulls of the people in these um, CT scans from the NIH, which is all, you know, a free online database. So these skulls yeah. have been CNC milled. Um, so what's at the basis of this is a CNC milled skull taken from this database. And then I taught myself how to do forensic facial reconstruction, like this kind of stuff from archeology span or forensics, where you put the depth gauges for the different sort of flesh and the eyes come from, actually that's the only thing in it. You pointed out the only thing in it that doesn't come from Bushwick, the Bushwick area, <laughs> which they actually come from. Although I found out about them because I found them in a Bushwick warehouse that was being cleared out. They are um, uh, broken glass eyes from the Lausche uh, glass, I manufacturer in Germany, Thuringberg, Thuringberg, Germany, from the 1860s. Um, the you know preeminent prosthetic glass eye maker in the world for the longest time, where Germans German glass was really obviously like done to a high degree of specificity, which is why all the lenses, camera lenses, are German companies. Um, and a lot of the factories were bombed uh, into rubble in World War One. But prior to that, in the turn of the century. Um, the sort of artisanal glass, highest you know caliber artisanal glass prosthetic eyes came from this area. Uh, there, there's a huge um, online community of people who trade and buy and collect these because they're collector's items. But I found someone in who lives next to the bombed out ruins of the factory in Germany, who um, go on eBay has a store where he just goes through this factory and sifts through with a sieve and puts up all the relics that he finds on eBay. And I worked out a deal with him where he actually, any of the ones that were broken or cracked or for whatever reason were not mint and he wasn't gonna get any money from them. Um, I, he would, whenever he found those, he would contact me and I would buy them in bulk from him for cheap. Um, and I found out about this whole world because my former mentor um, from VCU, one of the sort of my favorite artists of all time, Elizabeth King, um, trained with this uh, guy who made glass prosthetic eyes in uh, New York. And I went to visit her and visit this guy, one of the two people in the country who still know how to, who still knew how to do it. And he had a broken mm. one in his collection that he gave to me. Mm. Wow. It's like this deep history of like lamp working and glass eyes. So mm -hmm. that's where those eyes come from, was sort of like mm. this guy in, in um, suburban Queens who, in his basement, it's one of the few people who still knows how to do the like really tiny, mm -hmm. the art, art right. of making prosthetic eyes to match a glass eye to the, you know, the number eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm. Well, that was a really great talk, Taylor. Thank you so much. Anybody else have any last questions before we let y'all go? No? Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taylor. And we'll, yeah, totally. we'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you yep. at 11 a.m. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the visits. Yeah, we're, I'm super excited. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night.